Hi, everybody, and welcome to Metaphysical Insights. I'm William Becker, and I'm very pleased today to have as my guest Rob Guttrow. Rob is a pet medium, a very accomplished author, and a fascinating person. It's going to be a great hour. Uh, go ahead and ask questions if you want in the comment uh, part. And um, well, Rob, welcome. I'm really happy to have you on the show. Well, thanks, William. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to join you today. Ah, thank you. We've been chatting a little bit, and there's so much to talk about. We obviously can't cover it all, um, not in one show. But how did you get into this? Um, Pet Medium is a pretty specialized branch. It's not something I have much experience with. And how did how did you do this? And how do you develop this? Well, it, it's kind of a long story, but the the short <laughs> version is is that um, I realized I had a gift when I was a kid, about thirteen, and I saw a human. Um, my grandfather appeared mm -hmm. to me, um, and it was about seven months after he died. Um, turned out my mother had the ability, and then other people in my family had the ability, um, and over time things just happen. Um, but I didn't pay much attention until my puppy passed away mm -hmm. in, uh, in 2005. So he kind of opened the doors for my ability to communicate um, with, with pets on the other side. Um, and I'm a dog dad. Uh, we've had, we now have four dogs in spirit and we have two living dogs. Okay. And uh, my husband and I have worked with rescue uh, for about 10 years. Fantastic. Wow. Now, you mentioned that you saw your grandfather. So you work with human entities as well? Yes. Um, yeah. But, although I, <laughs> I've kind of worked more on the human side, but um, everybody wants to talk to their pets. So everybody, uh, everybody I hear from asks me for, you know, pet uh, communications. Okay. Makes sense. People... It's really interesting to me the connection people have with their pets these days. I I always had a dog and a cat when I was growing up, and I loved them. I, I mean, if my lifestyle allowed it, I'd have a dog on my lap right now. But um, it's a lot of responsibility and commitment and time, and I live alone, and I go away a lot. So I'm not a good person to be a dog dad. But... Um, the the questions it seems like for people wanting to communicate with their pets compared to family members even it seems like they're very different they're they're emotional in a very a deep bonding way that there's a there's a difference i feel from what i hear about what people talk about about their pets and what they're asking questions about than what I get as a medium from clients wanting to talk to relatives or who's around or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, Katie Brown is watching with her dog, Scott, Scout. So, cool. So do you notice that kind of a thing? Um, yeah, I do. Um, so I, I've talked to uh, quite a number of people um, in, the, in the field. Uh, a very good friend of mine, um, Dr. William Charmack is a medical psychologist, and so he wrote a chapter for me in Pets in the Afterlife 3, um, which is about messages from spirit dogs, and uh, he provided a chapter on how to deal with grief. Now, what I have experienced is, is what you said, is that people who lost a pet tend to be uh, in grief more deeply than those who lost a human. Right. Uh, and the reason for that is that we always look at pets as our children because um, you know, we raise them the same way as we raise a human child. We take them to school, um, we take them to the doctor, we teach them how to play well with others. Um, we're happy when they eat, you know, um, when, they, when they do the right thing. We teach them language, they learn routine. Um, and the only difference is, really, is that, you know, they don't grow up, get a, get their own career, 
marrying someone you don't like. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> um, and the other thing too is that, you know, pets only have a lifetime, usually around 15 years. So because we always look at them as children, even though they age, it's like losing a child. And that's what's so traumatic about it. Um, okay. And, and in my books, the other thing I mentioned is, is our studies, research, scientific studies that prove that they have the intelligence of a three to five year old child and that they also have the same exact emotions that humans have. That's fascinating. And I'm wondering if there's been a difference too. When I was a kid, yeah, I lived a little bit in the country and everybody, the dogs ran around. There was no such thing as a school for them. Um, you fed them off the table and you fed them out of the can and i mean you took care of them and you loved them and you did things but they weren't raised quite the same way as children were ours would also pick vegetables out of the garden and you know but so i wonder if you're noticing a difference um from people that might want to get a hold of an animal that wasn't raised quite the same intense way that they are nowadays Sure. Um, my my father-in-law was raised with a lot of dogs that were kept outside. Mm -hmm. uh, he was raised in the country, and you know they he said that they they didn't let the dogs in the house. Um, they had heaters outside and all that in their in their you know d uh, sheds there. But um, it's a different. You're right. It's it's totally different, and uh, we've come a long way. Um, but you know even archaeological studies have revealed that humans have uh, have welcomed like wolves 10,000 years ago yeah. so we've been trying to domesticate pets for a long time and it it wasn't till i don't know the last 30 years i would say 40 years that we've really started looking at them more as companions um, and realizing that they have intelligence that they have you know the same emotions they have the same soul despite what some religions will tell you, um, which is foolishness, <laughs> you know. Um, that's one of my hot button questions is that people say, well, animals don't have souls. Well, of course they have souls. That's ridiculous. Um, a soul is a memory. Memories, personality, and knowledge couple with the energies that are within us. And every living thing has a soul. So, um, so yeah, we, we have finally acknowledged the fact that these beautiful caring animals teach us unconditional love something that humans are pretty much incapable of you know achieving you know except maybe for our dogs it was it was always easier to forgive the dog for making a mess even though we didn't raise the dog the same way as you would a kid you know when i was a kid then it was to forgive the kid down the block from right <laughs> or you know your sister from kicking you um so um that's fascinating and i was i've wondered about the soul aspect for a while because you hear about it from some ancient traditions um hindi um for example and some of the other ones and i have experience being led to animal graves i'm sure i've seen animals but i'm i'm one of these people i'm really skeptical including of myself and i need some kind of a verification of proof Mm -hmm. If I pick up on something, I need to be able to put something else with it to know that it's real, not my imagination. And I know the difference between how my mediumship works and my imagination works. But still, if I don't know that this animal has a soul, for sure, then I can't say what I'm talking to them about as a soul or what I'm seeing is real. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And yeah. you're helping me to see that, yes, these these really are are real. And um, I knew they had intelligence, but I had no idea it was that degree of intelligence. Yeah. So um, Dr. Stanley Corbin is someone that I said often in my books, and he um, he's studied animals for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, he's concluded that they have the uh, the ability, uh, the um, the intelligence of a three to five year old child. Um, and if you think about it, you know, they, they learn our language, they read our behavior, they read our emotions, they have the same exact emotions that we have, they grieve when a, when a fellow pet passes, 
they get angry when somebody steals their toy. Um, and, uh, they get irritated with us when we don't feed them on time, just like people do. Right. So, you know, to me, there's absolutely no difference um, between how a pet thinks and behaves than, than a human. And, and like you said, they forgive and they don't hold grudges like people do. <laughs> now, do they remember the same way that we would, I mean, or do they, do they live in the present, not the future or the past more than a human would? Yeah, they, they live in the, in the present day and every day is a learning experience for them. And it's just like when you take them to school, I, we have, um, we have a dachshund that we've, ta I've taken to agility courses and he learns different things every week, every week. And he remembers what he learned. So, um, he, yeah, he learned, he lives in the present, but I will tell you though, for the people that are listening who have, who have adopted a foster dog, that have taken in a dog that was from a rescue, that the dog in their first family that may have been abusive or neglectful, they remember that. They absolutely remember that. And when they cross over, they bond with the new family that has taken them in and love them, loves them uh, as much as possible. Um, and most of our dogs have been rescued. Um, and, and some have been in terrible, terrible homes. Uh, our, our little dachshund came to us with a uh, hot worm positive and we had to treat him and find, him, you know, he got over it. But um, yeah. another dog came to us in, in rescue and he had to have 22 teeth removed. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. It was awful. And he was 11. I don't know how people can treat anything that way human, animal, whatever. I mean, I, don't, I just don't get it. I'm sorry. It, well, that kind of thing leaves me It's speechless. a reflection of humanity, and it's not really a good reflection, to be honest with you. But No, it isn't. Yeah, there are people that should not have pets because they don't deserve them. But Yeah, and the pets don't deserve the people. That's true. Now, one of the questions... Hey, Vivian, who set up this page, is on now, too, saying hi. Hi, Vivian. Hey, everybody. She's in, she's in uh, Cambridgeshire. The, the, her, her town is the uh, town of Queen Boudicca of um, um, Iona, Ionian tribe fame and uh, giving the Romans a one-two punch for a while. But... Um, do you, with the um, the animals, one of the things with human reincarnation that seems to fit with what my own feeling is and my own experience and what I've studied is that we choose the life we're being born into. Now, do you think animals have that same and, and do the same thing? In terms I do. Of what kind of animal and which kind of home and all the rest? I, yeah, I do, I do agree with that. Absolutely. Um, we all know before, before we come here what we're going to get into. Um, and, and we do that because our soul has to grow. Our soul has to <clears throat> expand so that we can achieve a higher level on the other side. Yeah. That makes sense. If you're a short time. Um, <clears throat> and one example of that is my dog, Buzz. Buzz was a Weimaraner that I had. Um, he passed away at, at um, seven months old. This is Buzz on the cover of my Pets in the Afterlife one cat, uh, cover. Um, Buzz was the limer on it. And he was seven months old when I was walking him and his leash opened and he ran across the street and he was killed by a car. Uh -oh. um, it was the most horrible thing I've ever experienced in my life. And he was only here for seven months. But Buzz is the one that showed me that he, through his passing and through all his messages, he has provided me with the ability to heal so many people from their grief. So that was his greatest gift. And that's why he was only here a short time. Wow. That's fascinating. It's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, it took me a while to figure it out. 
Mm -hmm. And um, not blame yourself, I would imagine, too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, and yeah, Roger is on, too. Hi, Rob, or Roger. Um, how many, then the way I do this is I kind of jump around just as things come, but you've got eight books out, right? I do. And why don't you kind of give us a little bit of an idea of the different ones? I put up on the um, the comment room how to get a hold of Rob. If you can't see it, let me know and I'll put it up again. But yeah, if you could kind of go over the books that you've got out, it'd be great. Sure. <clears throat> so I, I will say out of the eight, uh, five of them are about people. <laughs> three of them are about pets. <clears throat> I just published Pets in the Afterlife 3, <clears throat> which are messages from spirit dogs. One and two <clears throat> are about the ways that dogs, cats, birds, and even horses can communicate. So basically any domesticated pet can come through to me because, and, and the reason for that <clears throat> is that they learn our words and our habits and our emotions and so forth. So I, they can relate to humans and it makes it easier for me to connect to them. I can't connect to wild animals. Okay. <clears throat> so the the other five books um, are filled with, with my encounters with earthbound ghosts and spirits who crossed over. Um, my, I will tell you that my first book was inspired by Buzz, who passed. Mm -hmm. But it was also inspired by the fact that <clears throat> my dad communicated with me after he passed and helped me convince my own family that he was at his own wake and his own funeral. So that was awesome. um, it. I also got the, uh, you know, I used to watch all the paranormal shows and stuff like that. But And one thing that always bothered me is that they would call everything a ghost or spirit and that's not accurate to me um i think a ghost when we pass uh, the energy the energy combined with memory's personality and knowledge choose a place to stay in a fixed location on the earth and i call that a ghost mm -hmm. ones that cross over into the light are ones that i call a spirit so to me, there's a, a distinction. Um, right. Ghosts can only communicate with you in the fixed location of their choosing, but spirits on the other side can communicate with you anytime, anywhere in the world, even on vacation. Um, so that's Ghosts and Spirits. Lessons Learned from Talking to the Dead is another book filled with paranormal investigations I did and uh, places I visited. Um, relative to that is uh, the other book that I just published <clears throat> last, uh, last summer called Case Files of Inspired Ghost Tracking. That's that's this one here. Um, and that's the paranormal group I belong to. And I take you on the investigations that we went into private homes uh, trying to figure out what's going on. We, we ran into uh, or, uh, many earthbound ghosts. Um, we ran into dark energy, residual energy. We ran into uh, young teenagers who uh, generated energy that simulated ghostly activity, aka poltergeists. Mm -hmm. um, we were on a double murder investigation. All kinds of crazy things in that. So if you <laughs> if you want to go on a paranormal investigation, read that book because you'll feel like you're on the investigation. And um, so. And the last two, one is my experiences in England. I, I went to England twice <clears throat> with my, my partner. And uh, everywhere I went, there was a dead person that wanted to talk to me. And they're from all different centuries, by the way. <laughs> so, right. It's like it's like having a dead tour guide, really, when you're in a historic place. <laughs> so, that's one of my favorite books because it's filled with history and <clears throat> And lots of pictures and all the ghosts I met. Um, and and the other one, the Latin, the eighth book is Kindred Spirits. That's this one. Um, Kindred Spirits is about how when I met my partner, his late partner, who died in 1996, that I never met in life, decided he was going to tag along. So it's kind of like three people are in this relationship. It's kind of like a triangle. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but he's always been there when we needed him. He actually saved us in England when we got lost by sending someone who looked exactly as he would have looked 
Patty wow. Bird. Yeah. So, so many diverse books about the paranormal, um, but there's so many aspects of it. Yeah. Thanks for letting me share this. Now, tell me more about England. Where, do, where all did you go? England's special in my heart. Did you live there? I lived there once for only three months, and I've been, I don't know, Vivian, what, five, six times? Um, I've got several friends over there, and it's where it was the first place in my life at age 27 I felt at home the first time I landed without knowing a soul. Kind of interesting. <clears throat> so, you, so you live there in a past life? I. I've found, I've stumbled into a few past lives while I've been over there. You know, you're exploring areas and then all of a sudden it's, wait a minute, that's me I see over there. Or, yeah, that back digging is mine. Or, oh, that's my burial cyst. Okay. Um, you know, things like that. So it's, wow. It, it, I, I can understand the connection I have. I'm finding that with countries I go to, I re resonate the strongest with there's some kind of past life. But where are all some of the highlights and stuff anyway? I know we can't go over everything, but places that really resonated with you and the entities and the the metaphysics of it as well, you know. The... Yeah. So, um, so I'll show you the cover of the book. That's this is it right here. It's like people people running down a uh, stone walk, uh, stone corridor, and the lighting was crazy. So it made it look like they were being chased by a ghost, but they weren't. <laughs> it was a nighttime ghost film. Um, some of the highlights. So we went to England, number one, because my partner is a is fascinated by the Tudors, the Tudor period. Uh -huh. You know, I never paid attention to it. That's his thing. Um, you know, my thing is the paranormal thing. <clears throat> so, um, so he planned all the trips. And uh, this really great travel agent called Across the Pond Vacations, they helped plan everything with him. And I just said, you know, when you're done, just, you know, tell me where we're going. I don't, I don't know anything about it. Um, and that's what he did. So a couple of things that are really interesting there. Um, number one is that the very first place we went was Westminster Abbey. Have you been there? Yes. Not since I was 27, but I've been there. Okay. So, you know, you remember how massive it is and how they have that little poet's corner where like two or 300 people are buried and um, mm -hmm. they have uh, bodies of kings and queens there. Um, so in Westminster, and there's supposed to be a monk that haunts that, that abbey as well. Right. Because yeah. the abbey is not the original one. I think there was a... Wasn't there an Anglo-Saxon one there first? I think so, in like 1099 or something like that. Yeah. Um, but what's interesting there is, so my partner has always been drawn to England, and he couldn't figure it out. It all unfolded when we went to Westminster Abbey, because suddenly <clears throat> he started sensing dead people. And he was around one of the tombs where a king was and he <clears throat> and he came over to me and he said he smelled what smelled like a rotting corpse wow. and he said i sense there's a man standing here and i actually <clears throat> i saw the outline of the man and i said yeah there is and i think it's that king that <clears throat> that's in that tomb and so his abilities he has abilities and they awakened in westminster abbey um, one of the really crazy things that happened, <clears throat> not that that's not crazy enough, but <clears throat> we were standing in front of the tomb of Anne of Cleves. Okay. Now, Anne of Cleves is one of Henry VIII's wives. Right. Uh, <clears throat> I think she was number four, <clears throat> I think, or five. I can't remember. I can't. I can't. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were about 20 feet apart, and we were both looking directly at the tomb. Um, I was here. He was here. And... Um, suddenly somebody pulled the hair on our head on my, my side here and his side here it was like somebody had 20 foot long arms that reached out and pulled our hair at the same time and we both turned to each other 
And he said, did you pull my hair? And I'm like, I, how could I pull your hair? He said, I'm over here. And, and I said, I thought you pulled my hair. It was a ghost. Wow. Yep. So that was that was great. Uh, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so everywhere we went, I mean, I, <clears throat> I ran into people who ran shops hundreds of years ago. There was one <clears throat> one woman who was like a barmaid. She was working in the Old Thatch Tavern in Canterbury. Okay. I swore that she was a living person coming over with a basket of bread. Wow. And when I when I told my partner, he said, there's nobody there. And I looked again, and there was nobody there. <laughs> so I have been doing what I, I can see them in my mind. So I sketched them out. And all of my books are filled with sketches of ghosts and spirits. Wow. Um, so there was that. Um, and and um, one of the other one of the other fascinating stories. There's so many in there. Um, is when we went to Beaver Castle. Have you been there? No, I've been by it, but I haven't been in it. Oh, you need to go. Mine over there go there all the time. Especially because you have psychic abilities. Yeah. You have abilities. So, um, again, I didn't know who these castles belonged to or <clears throat> who lived where. Yeah, he knew that. He, Tom knew all that. Uh -huh. We went in the castle, and the first thing I heard in my ear was, <clears throat> this is George. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> good for you. I, I said, uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry you're, you're still here, but who are you? And he said, I'm George. I lived here. And so I said, okay, I, that doesn't mean anything to me. So I, Tom saw me talking to myself, and he said, who are you talking to? And I said, I'm talking to a guy named George. I said, he's a young guy. I don't know who he is. And he said, uh, that would be George Bolin. This is the oh. home of the Bolin family. And George Bolin was executed by Henry VIII. As it turned out, William, uh, George Bolin walked with us in every room, told me how he burnt his elbow in the fireplace, told me where Anne's bedroom was, told me the year that he was most proud of his sister. And I, so I wrote all these things down. I always keep a journal when I travel. <clears throat> and I, the moment I had to look all these things up. It turns out uh, the year that he gave me was the year that Anne got her first royal title. Okay. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yep. I know any of this stuff. So that was fascinating. So we had George Bolin as a tour guide in his uh, childhood home. It doesn't get any better than that. Nope. Uh, nope. Geez. So, so th those are some of the quick tiny highlights of the ghosts of england on mediums vacation but um if, if people decide to pick that up uh they'll learn a lot of history and they'll see a lot of photographs of the different places and so forth so you'll uh, mm. I, yeah. you know I would, I would take that with me if i go back to england and you know see if you can communicate with these people that'd be a good idea because you've been to some of these places i either haven't been to or i haven't been to for a long time like um the cock or the abbey i've been to some of the other ones and did you get a chance to go to any of the neolithic and bronze age sites um amesbury stonehenge kennett longbarrow no and, okay um we did go to we did go to oh that was in that was in ireland we went to a mound out in in ireland in dublin Oh, there's a big famous one there that I haven't gotten to. Um, yeah, I can't remember the name of it, but um, actually, that's another book that I have written. I have to edit it. It's called Ghosts of Ireland and Scotland on a Media okay. Education. <laughs> so that's coming up. Excellent. Excellent. Oh, jeez. I see that one of the people in the chat has uh, lives near Peterborough Cathedral. Yep, she does. She's a good friend of mine and... I stay with her and her husband when I'm over there. And Vivian, I think, was working in Peterborough. I went with her husband to Ely, Con to Ely Cathedral. We even climbed up to the roof. Um, 
Well, that's on our list. Um, so, um, who was Henry VIII's last wife? I can't remember. I think Catherine of Aragon was her, his first wife. Right. The last ones. The last one survived, I think. She did. I she did. We went, to, we went to her. Uh, we went to the castle where she lived. I think it was Sudley Castle, and she's okay. buried in a chapel back there. Sidley is a really familiar name. I don't think I've been there, but has a beautiful garden. Yeah. Now Vivian's asking. You know, just put this up. Do I ever see the bad stuff? Uh huh. <laughs> yeah, I do. Um, yeah, um, I've met some really not nice dead people. Um, yeah. and, and to be honest with you, many of them were not nice in the first place, which is why right. they didn't cross over because they were afraid of what was on the other side. Um, now, just for clarity, yeah. not nice person. These are not demons, right? No. Okay. Yeah. No. All the demon lovers out there. So I, I have, a, yeah, I have a theory about demons. Um, and my theory is, so for everybody who's, who's watching and listening, I, I'm a scientist. That's what I do in my daytime job. Mm -hmm. um, so as a scientist, everything I write about is based in science, based on the science of energy. Um, in terms of demons, I am quite sure that there is life throughout the cosmos. Mm -hmm. We've already found 3,800 exoplanets. We have another 4,700 exoplanets that we haven't cataloged yet. Um, and, and I know that those, many of those have the ability to support life. Um, mm -hmm. at my opinion of demons is that they're just energy entities from another solar system, another universe. And they come here because they're energy. They can go anywhere they want. And, and because they don't know what we are, they behave, they can behave violently. They can behave, you know, like a, ca a, a caged animal um, or a cornered animal. Um, so that's my opinion. Of that, that makes a lot of sense. And I also think that there's a lot of interdimensional travel. From mm -hmm. my experience, that's what a lot of the in elementals, the so-called fae or the mythical creatures, because I've actually seen some. I've had physical interaction, not just psychically or telepathic and and such with them and i know it sounds crazy but they seem to be coming in and out of other dimensions not necessarily another planet off of our own solar systems but i think both are possible i mean it's said that we can visit wherever we want to after we pass mm -hmm. so yeah. why could they and sometimes well like a friend of mine and i'm not going to tell her story for her but she was on a case and there was an entity that got horribly violent and all kinds of things. Mm. But he thought they were the demons. Because he came from, a, he was a, a knight. He came from a very religious period, like the 13th, 14th century. Sure. He thought these were the evildoers. And so he was protecting himself and others from them being satanic was his idea and i think there's a lot of that can happen i mean we look at us especially women and i'm not picking on women but men have always gotten away with a little bit more flexibility than women and that includes in the past with the ghosts our our dress has changed drastically but it's not from over the periods of time but it's not as scandalously changed mm -hmm. as women's dresses and even just over here, I mean, I'm on the, I'm on the new coast from where you are as far as European settlement goes, and women who are wearing pants and sleeveless tops and have their own bank accounts and are a little, a little bossy and forceful, great people, um, have some real problems sometimes with some of these cowboy entities that, or even out of the 19 early 1900s and. You know, I've had friends get poked and elbowed and hit and just about everything else because they're not ladies, according to the tradition of the time. Sure. And I would imagine over there you could find even more of that. 
um, with an entity and ah, fantastic. Yeah, so, so that's a great point. People really live in the period in which they die uh, mm -hmm. in, as earthbound ghosts. So they would be um, totally confused by the way that we behave today and not understand what kind of things that we have. Like it, a cell phone would be, you know, probably considered something that's demonic. To probably, because especially with these older periods, Science didn't exist the way we have it. If once you start looking at Darwinian periods, we're getting a little bit more. Even in the late 18th century, mm -hmm. you're getting more steam and a few things. But um, electronics, having a little thing that glows light when you push a button, something like this. I mean, it has to be. It would have to be very difficult for them to deal with, I would think. Unless they, they died around 1970, then they saw it all on Star Trek. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I, I used to think about it with my grandmother. She, she was born in Tsarist Russia in 1889 or 1890. Mm -hmm. And they were a well-to-do family, Germans. We weren't Russian. And the big farms and all the rest of it. And going from, they had technology and they had threshing machines and stuff like that. It wasn't winnowing and all that. But going from that to flying, to seeing the man land on the moon, which she blames for changing the weather. She said that, yes, we landed on the moon. That made the weather go crazy because they knocked it out of kilter a little bit when they landed on it. I think she believed it. Um, and then flying to Hawaii. I mean, so you have somebody from these time periods where what she did later in her life wasn't even imagined in the first part of her life. And I always had a lot of respect for that. It just seems remarkable. Yeah. 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 Um, um, so what, to kind of bring it back, um, one of the... One of the ghosts that I met in England was a dog, um, a dog that was tied to their owner in the owner's former house that decided to stay when their owner passed. Um, and I, I noticed that some of your, your viewers there were talking about their pets that passed, that gave them signs and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm really happy to see that, that, that they're, you know, they're so observant that they were able to pick up on those signs um because sometimes it can be quite startling uh, you know if you see the shadow of your pet after your pet passed <laughs> um and that's that's actually something that I, I wanted to address william because um people automatically think that shadows are bad but mm -hmm. not from a science perspective um and i can explain that okay so spirits and ghosts are energy entities. So I right. look at them as kind of a light bulb that doesn't have a big charge. Right. Uh, when they get energy, they can light up. You can see them more visibly. Um, so if a, if a spirit that's visiting you, like your dog or your cat, um, doesn't have a lot of energy, but they want, they want to show you that they're still around, they may appear as a shadow. And maybe just briefly as a shadow, and they may just run right past you. Um, the reason why they can't appear in full color is because it takes a lot of energy to do that. It, it takes a lot of energy to light that light bulb all the way up. And even and, more, I would think, to be solid. What's that? And even more, I would think, to be in a solid form instead of more translucent or something like that. Or yeah, like, absolutely. Yeah. So the, the types of energy that ghosts and spirits both use are physical energies like heat, light, water, and electricity. <clears throat> that's why they can play with the electricity in your house. And, and that's why haunted places typically are, are usually near a, a stream or a river or an ocean. Uh, more places that are haunted have water near them. Um, and they also rely on emotional energy. So earthbound ghosts, 
seem to rely on negative emotional energy like fear, anxiety, depression, anger, stuff like that. Right. And spirits of our loved ones uh, seem to rely on love, faith, and hope. So it's mm -hmm. our love that brings them back. Yeah. No, I think I think there's a lot to that. And I know with a lot of my clients that are having problems in a house, usually the advice I give them is open the drapes, keep mm -hmm. the bike outside, put on nice music, bring in flowers. Lots of yellow always comes through to me. But change that energy in the house mm -hmm. because – and get therapy if you need it. You know, I'm not a therapist, but yeah. sometimes working with the living, sometimes that's part of what just comes across as far as working with all that energy that's in the house. And yeah. and I don't know that always I find them, that they're stuck there, but they're there. Their, their energy – I haven't found somebody I'd call trapped, but I have come across a lot of them, and I – Totally agree with everything you said about the energy and everything else, but um, they either visit or like to be there, or they've chosen to be there for reasons or to come back if they're more of what you'd call a ghost, in, in my experience. Um, but it's, it's all I also, I also found that spirits of our loved ones come back around certain times, and they tend to be birthdays, anniversaries, and holidays. Like anniversary is a very special day. It doesn't mean a wedding anniversary. Um, right. And for, particularly with pets, it could be the anniversary of their passing. It could be the anniversary of their adoption um, or some other significant event. Um, and, and, you know, so it goes with, with pets and people um, as well. Yeah. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think part of that might be too because we think about loved ones on specific anniversaries too. Yeah, and, and for people who want to understand why pets are able to figure that out, I can tell you why. Okay. Um, and it's all about energy. When around birthdays, anniversaries, or holidays, usually our emotional energy is elevated because those are happy occasions. Right. So pets, because they're energy, they can read energy, and emotional energy is part of that. So they can read when our emotional energy has been elevated and they know it's a special day, and that's why they will come and pay us. Okay. And usually it's around, I find it's around two weeks on either side of the day. Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah. What kinds of things do the, the pets, do the animals actually tell you? I, I mean, they're, they're speaking in English. I mean, I'm assuming this is a telepathic process pretty much with the mediumship. So yes. it's not like quite hearing the language. But is it very much like you and I are talking? I mean, the thoughts and, and such, or are they simpler? Are they complex? Are they able to put the, um, I don't mean uh, guess, but I mean, it's not like, talk, is it like talking to a, a child, a toddler or an adult? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it's really more kind of talking to an adult. Okay. Um, even though they have the, the intelligence of a three to five year old child, um, what they do f for me is, is probably, it's not really going to be the same that what they would do for their pet parent, unless their pet parent was a medium, but they do give plenty of signs for their pet parent. So for me, what they do is they, they'll convey, um, they'll show me pictures, like their favorite thing, um, their favorite place. They will give me names that they've heard. Um, they, um, they'll tell me maybe if they have a sibling there, uh, a favorite toy, um, or something unique. So for instance, uh, William, last week I did a, a reading for a woman who lost her cat. Okay. And she wanted to know all kinds of questions. <clears throat> and one of the things her cat kept telling me was the word mala, M-A-L-A. Now, I don't know this woman. I, I, I didn't know where she was writing from. It turned out she was writing from the Netherlands, which I found out after I did the reading. Um, not that that matters, because it still didn't make any sense to me <laughs> what the word meant. So that word stuck out in my mind, and I wrote it to her, and I said, your cat is just, just telling me mala, mala, mala. I said, I don't know what that word means. 
Uh-huh. And I said, I know, I know Spanish, the word mal means bad, but I don't know what mala is. So she wrote me back and she was, um, she said she was just totally bowled over because mala is the name of a meditation she does every morning and her cat is in the room. And she, and she said, only my cat would know that. Wow. And I thought, oh my gosh, that's crazy. <laughs> uh, so there you go. Um, a, another pet that recently gave me a, um, a sign that also blew me away. And my books are filled with these examples, by the way. Um, and this, was, this is also not in one of the books. It was this dog. <clears throat> uh, this dog passed away, and uh, James wrote me, and he said that his dog Win or Winnie passed away. And um, Winnie told me that he was with uh, a woman on the other side named Elizabeth or Liz. And Winnie showed me the pattern of like a, a Scottish pattern, like a tartan color kind of pattern. Um, so I wrote this stuff to, to James, and I said, I don't know who Liz is. I don't know if the Scottish pattern means anything to you. <laughs> I said, you know, I, I I almost feel foolish that I'm, you know, typing this stuff out. But he wrote me back and he said, I told my wife about the reading, and he said, <clears throat> my wife said that her friend Liz passed away. She she went to, uh, uh, I think she was in a university or something that she worked at, um, and he said my wife showed me a picture of her and Liz, and in the picture. Liz was wearing a tartan skirt. And I was like, oh my gosh, it is amazing what pets can communicate from the other side. Amazing. Yes. Yeah. It is. <laughs> and, and they get their, their, I hate to call it owners. I mean, you've got me totally rethinking the idea of a pet and the relation of humans to pets. And this is, I'm glad. But, owner really doesn't quite seem the right word anymore. Their human companion or partner. Are, are they able to give words of consolation and words of, um, no, I mean, including words of advice or mm -hmm. warnings or, okay. Sure. Um, so one of the, <clears throat> one of the most common things that I, I get asked is, um, uh, did I do the right thing? Did I help them cross over? And often the pet will tell me yes. Um, uh, usually, in fact, people wait too long. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, is that pets will always tell me to tell their parents not to feel guilty. Okay. Because I, I mean, I know as a dog dad, I've had to help, you know, three of our dogs cross over and I felt horrible. I felt guilty, felt terrible. And then our, our, our kids would come back and give me signs that they were okay and it was the right thing to do. Um, so, uh, yeah, they'll, they'll tell you that. Um, what's, what's also interesting is that they'll also tell me if they want you to adopt another dog or cat or whatever. Um, I just did a reading earlier this afternoon before we talked and uh, I told, <clears throat> I told this woman that her, her female dog who passed over, I think the dog's name was Bella. Um, said that she wanted the woman to adopt another dog, but it can't be a boy. It has to be a girl. And she she just wrote me back an hour before we went on the air, and she said, my dog has a very big problem with male dogs. And she said, so I will be adopting a female dog. <laughs> Excellent. It's amazing what they can say. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. What, what an amazing thing you're able to do for people. I mean, what um, you can give them, I mean, this is incredible. It's, uh, what a gift for, well, I would imagine for both of you. I mean, it, it, I don't look at abilities as a gift. It's part of who we are. It's part of our makeup. I think everybody has psychic ability and, and such to a degree. I think it helped us keep from getting eaten by saber-toothed tigers and, you know, things like that back in the old days. In the old days. But people don't develop it. But what you're able to do for people and the peace 
um, joy even at sad moments. I think it's amazing. Yeah, it's it, it, it's healing for both them and, and myself because you know because I said that we've lost four dogs of our own. So um, this just helps me understand all the different ways that pets can communicate from the other side. Um, and, and I have to say, when I'm doing some of these readings, I will get very emotional. And that's why I only do readings, by the way. I don't do readings on the phone. I only do I only do them on the computer. I ask people to send me a picture and their name, the name of the dog or cat or whatever, and any questions. Because I, you know, I'll sit here at my computer and I'll be crying like a baby. Okay. And you know, I, I don't want to do that on the phone. <laughs> right. I understand. I do a lot of my readings on Zoom or Messenger or something if they're not in person, because I like to see the person. It's I like the human connection and contact, you know, better that way. I'll do them on the phone, but yeah, every once in a while the tears start. I've just reached a point where I don't care. <laughs> well, I'm an emotional sponge, you know. <laughs> I cry at com commercials for gosh sake. <laughs> well, I certainly cried a bit the other day when um, we hit the 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 Mars landing, but you know, I've. I'm old enough. I remember John Glenn and uh, Gemini, and I mean, I was not even in school yet, and I was glued to that TV screen. And um, yeah, it's the space science. I wish my uh, had a a better math understanding. I'd be over there. Um, another question about these is yeah, that i have is are the animals once they pass are they no this isn't about religion it's about i'm going to use the word divine as a catch-all word of the world beyond okay the connection where we're all connected the kind of the universe within the 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 place where all souls merge and are together where we're part of everything mm -hmm. and we're part of all knowledge is in our own wisdom mm -hmm. is in, in my particular understanding now are the pets when they're over there able to connect with that and talk about it um they don't really talk about the other side they all, all they tell me is that <clears throat> they're at peace and they're they've restored in their health um okay. and, um, and it, because their energy, they can go anywhere, anytime. So if people are, uh, on vacation, they can, they can show up there. Um, and, and I can give you an example of that. Um, but my books are all based on energy and there's nothing about religion within there if you have religious uh, uh religious views you can apply your religion to the science of energy so that that's yeah. how i do it and that makes sense i mean i i try to take religion away as far as an organized practice religion from everything i do and everything mm -hmm. i teach sure. and let it all talk and come to us as it as it is but that energy pool, I guess, is basically it where all of the energy meets in some way. Yeah. I, I guess that's a better way to describe it. Yeah, we all come together. Uh huh. And um, I, it's fascinating. It really so, so do I, do I have to have time to tell you a, a brief um, story about how <clears throat> pets can show up anytime, anywhere? Yes, please. Okay, um, so back back in 2009, um, Tom and I were on vacation. We went to Puerto Rico, and we um, weren't thinking of anything but being on vacation. So we came to a, this is how pets will influence us to do things, by the way. So we came to an intersection where there are multiple roads we could go down. There are five choices we could make. I felt nudged, if you would. To go down one way. He said, and we had never been there before, it was San Juan, Puerto Rico. We were there just on our vacation. <clears throat> so we get to the end of the road, cross the street, and there was a man walking 
a bunch of dogs. He was a professional dog walker in San Juan, Puerto Rico. One of the dogs he was walking was a Weimaraner that looked just like my Buzz. This is Buzz over here. Okay. <clears throat> um, at that moment, I heard in my head, <clears throat> Dad, I brought you here. And um, it was Buzz. Mm -hmm. And he said, I want you to know I'm still here. And, and then he said, do you know what day it is? And I think about it. It was February 22nd, 2009. It was four years to the day he passed away. Wow. So pets will lead you to another pet, <clears throat> another that looks like them. That's one of the ways that they communicate. Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, even now, I mean, what, it's 2021, 20, 12 years ago. I'm still choked up about it. Wow. Um, but, you know, the, the easiest way for people to get messages from pets are in their dreams. Ask them to come in your dreams. Um, they, okay. they get, uh, so, so my books are filled with stories, like one of them used social media. <laughs> You'll read about that in Pet 3. I know it's weird. But it's true. Um, they use coins. They'll get um, humans to help them with coins. Um, and um, you'll see them, you'll hear them, you'll smell them, um, all kinds of things. Well, this is fascinating. I know we're running out of time, but I wanted to get all that in. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. I, I wander a lot when I, when I do these things. Um, Vivian asks, if the pet tells you something a bit awkward or a bit bad, do you tell the owners? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know, they're, they're just being honest. Um, no pet has ever told me that their owners are going to be with them the next day. I'll tell you that. <laughs> so, um, right. Yeah. I think, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, in Honesty, I think, is important. It can be couched in a in a way that isn't blunt and like you're giving somebody right. a slap in the face. You have to be more friendly. <laughs> right. Oh, this is fantastic. Well, I think I've got all of your contact up, all your contact information up. Do you have anything else that you would like to put into this? you know, to comment on or talk about before we do, we've got, you know, just a handful of minutes left. And I want to give you a chance for last words. <laughs> uh, you so to speak. <laughs> yes, exactly. I thought about that after I said it. So. <laughs> um, yeah, the, the, well, one of the main messages that pets will tell me all the time is that they don't want their parents to feel guilty about helping them cross. And I think that's probably the most important thing. Um, also, uh, I, I can't tell you how many emails I get from people saying, tell my tell my dog or my cat or my horse that I love them. You don't need me to tell them that. They can hear you. Energy, they are energy. Sound is energy and thoughts are energy. And as such, if you think about them or if you say something out loud to them, they can hear you and they know how much you love them. Um, the, they, they do feel sad that they're not there with you anymore. But on the other hand, they're also happy that they're in spirit because they can go anywhere now, as, just as we talked about going to Puerto Rico on vacation. Right. Um, they will, they'll, they'll go in the car with you. And, you know, I can't tell you how many times I'm talking to a dog in spirit or a person in spirit in my car. And I'm glad that we have phones now that have speakers and, and so forth. Right. Because 20 years ago, people were thought I was crazy. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're always around us and they're looking out for us. Yeah. Now, do you think you have to say it out loud or can you just, can you keep your mouth closed and communicate yeah. just telepathically. Yeah, because thoughts are energy. I mean, think about how scientists measure thoughts. They're little electrical impulses that we that we measure every time we have a thought. Um so fantastic. I know that's that's my experience. I've I've been working hard 
on how to not be arrested by somebody in a white coat in the middle of the street while I'm talking to the folks. So. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Rob, this has been fascinating, and I want very much to have you on again. I, I really appreciate it. And to all of you who have listened, um, thank you for coming in. And I'll give you the links as soon as I have them up for the YouTube and the Facebook and so we can get out and let all those who couldn't be here live um, take part in this and to hear all the great things you've had to say. So thank awesome. you very much. Thank you, William. Thanks for having me. And thanks everybody for, uh, for watching too. I, I appreciate it. And know that that love lasts forever. What a beautiful way to end. <laughs>